One particular section, Art from the South Seas, entranced a young painter, Paul Gauguin. In the end, he was to abandon his wife and children and sail off to Tahiti in search of paradise. And it's the South Seas Gauguin that captures our imagination. For me, there's a slight problem with Gauguin. His life is so intertwined with his painting that I'm never quite sure whether I'm really seeing what's there or whether I'm reading in because I know the story. And it's such a wonderful story. A man who leaves everything to flee to the South Seas to paint. And of course, like all great escapes, it turned out to be very different from what he expected. Now, I think his art is based upon that conflict between the dream, the romantic, and the truth, the classical. And it's when he gets both together, those two sides of him, that he becomes a great painter, as I think he is here. It's called Nevermore, which of course is a very romantic title, and makes one think of Edgar Allan Poe, quoth the raven, nevermore. And that is the raven, though I must say it looks to me like a sort of mutated puffin, but still he's looking sinister enough and glaring in, and you don't even notice him at first, because you're completely taken up with this great image spread across the canvas so voluptuously. The golden green girl and all her innocence and beauty. And then you look again. The tension of the body. Look at the way those toes sort of tingle with her, with her nervous anxiety and her face with its suspicions and its fears. And you realize here is Gauguin admitting that the dream girl, the golden woman, was a person for herself. So what does nevermore mean? Well, one biographical meaning might mean that he's never again going to put Pahura, who is the model, the teenager with whom he was living, through what he had put her. She just had their baby and it had died. And part of that grieving, suspicious look might be turned on her lover. And perhaps he's saying to himself, nevermore. Meanwhile, in the brilliant light of the south of France, the myth of the artistic genius was taking startling form. Who hasn't heard of Vincent van Gogh, that tormented Dutchman who cut off part of his ear, who struggled with insanity, and who went on painting with such heroism? His one consolation was his faithful brother, Theo. With his help, Vincent eventually returned to northern France, though there was little time left to him. Never Van Gogh came to a new place, and Auvergne was the last new place in his life. He would paint it obsessively its streets, its gardens, its houses. But never, I think, with the great impact that this church at Auvergne has for us. Because, you see, we think of Van Gogh as a painter, but actually he only painted for the last 10 or so years of his life. He was set upon becoming a minister of the church, and it just didn't work. He was too violent, he was too stubborn, he was too... Difficult. The church just wouldn't have him. And in the end, I think, he turned to painting as another way of service. 
but he didn't forget. And here you see the church against that dark, sinister blue sky with those ominous streaks in it, almost carved out with paint, squatting there like a monster with the great tower threatening us. And the interesting thing is that there's no door. There's no way into this church. Even the windows are opaque. Now you can say logically, all right, the, the door is on the other side. But this is what he paints. A church that you can't get into. And this heroic peasant woman is having to go a long way around. And you feel that it's only by the utmost exercise of his will that he's kept this great turbulent image of the church there. It could have exploded, but he's held it in place. And once he's done that, the painting disintegrates into a kind of lava flow of path and greenery with these wild, wild frenetic strokes. It, it overflows on us, swallowing us up. But the church stands just. And I think that's what makes us feel such love for Van Gogh. Even if we've got the good fortune to have relative mental stability, it's only relative. We could all fragment, as Van Gogh did, but he battled with it. He took his fears and his madness and his anguish and out of it forced great art. Shortly after painting the church at Auvers, Van Gogh killed himself in a field near this graveyard where he now lies beside his brother. No horizon, no sense of hope or, or future. One can understand why Van Gogh came here to kill himself. He had felt his life was such a failure as an artist, as a person, parasite upon his brother. And you only have to look round to feel the kind of claustrophobic smallness of his world with his mental illness lowering above him. A and even shooting himself was a failure. And in imagination, one can follow him, dragging himself, bleeding, back to his little room to die, with only his devoted Theo to comfort him in his, in his poverty and, and his death. Nothing has brought the tragedy of Van Gogh's heroic and miserable life more home to me than the field. In the next program, we meet the three giants of modern art, Cezanne, Picasso and Matisse.